Welcome to today's CFA Institute webinar on, on Career Insights into Private Equity and Venture Capital. I am Priyank Singhvi, CFA. I'm Founder Director of Exponential Equations, a Strategy and Corporate uh, Finance Advisory Boutique, Founder Director of IXA Foundation, a Section 8 trying to tackle challenges to sustainability through science and technology, and an eager angel investor. I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Before I introduce the speaker, I have a few housekeeping announcements to make. One, today's webinar is scheduled for 60 minutes, approximately 45 minutes for the presentation, and rest to answer any queries that you may have. Please feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation. You can do so by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your viewer and typing your questions in the box. The links to the presentation will be available to view in the chat box. Finally, please complete the evaluation survey before you sign off today. We value your feedback and it helps us in addressing your needs better. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Mr. Abhishek Lukar, CFA. Abhishek is a principal at Jeff Capital Partners. He's based in Mumbai. Before joining Jeff Capital, he spent 16 years at Ascent Capital, a leading Indian mid-market PE firm. He was part of the founding team there. He also serves as a director on the boards of CFA Society India and Concord Enviro Systems. He has been involved with many marquee transactions, like Big Basket, NSE, RBL, Purefit, and GMR Energy. There are many more inspiring nuggets about Abhishek's illustrious career. You may find it useful to read, uh, read up on him on the webinar registration page. Over to you, Abhishek. Thanks, thanks, Priyank. Uh, a very good evening to all the people, and maybe good morning and good afternoon, depending on from which region of the world you are joining in. And wish you all a very happy new year. Uh, I have been given 60 minutes to uh, give small insights, which I have learned over the last many, many years into private equity and venture capital. I will try and uh, do my best. Over the last, over next 35, 40 minutes, I will be presenting a few slides and then probably we'll be focusing on the Q&A. So, So these are the four learning outcomes which I am targeting at. So I hope all the participants will be able to take their key takeaways uh, after the presentation is over. Uh, to begin with, uh, I will be giving you a, a quick overview of the Indian private equity industry. Uh, uh, but before we get into the industry data, I just want to spend a few minutes explaining the private equity model. So if you see, you know, uh, uh, the VCP manager, which is also called general partner in industry parallels, is are the fund managers or the asset managers who manages the fund. And then there are investors who are known as limited partners in private equity and venture capital ecosystem. So basically private equity or venture capital, and they're used interchangeably depending on the you know, size of the transaction, are is largely a partnership model, wherein limited partners put money in a in a vehicle, which is either called a venture fund or a private equity fund. And the, the GP, the general partner, who is called the fund manager or the VC manager, the P manager, also put some money into the fund. And that, that money is called as GP investment. And this is largely what they call it, skin in the game. So the money coming from limited partners LPs is called LP investment. Coming from GP into the fund is called GP investment. In the lieu of providing the management services, which is like managing the fund, the, the, the fund vehicle uh, pays fees to the, put to the GP and the fund also pays a share of their profit, which is called carry, the carried interest to the fund manager. Uh, the fund manager uses, uses this vehicle and invests in multiple companies, you know, in business one, business two, business three, and then build a portfolio. And that portfolio generates returns for the limited partners, which is eventually distributed back. These limited partners can be either banks, endowment funds, insurance companies, universities, uh, trusts, fund of funds, uh, even HNI, high net worth individuals, and some of the retail investors. So this is the, the overall framework how a private equity or venture capital business works. Uh, and, and this is very, very important for all of you to understand before you move on to the, to the career part in this industry. On this slide, I've tried and, and captured the types of private equity uh, you know, um, strategies or the vehicles which are there. You know, and, and these days, some of these are used, the lines between them are getting blurred and you know, 
some of these are used interchangeably for multiple things so so if you see there are two important areas which i'm trying to highlight one the risk and the return framework and the second one is the the nature of the vehicle uh, what it is called so so companies which are at idea stage when they raise money they typically are, are, are raised by incubators accelerators or if they are just funded by founders the, the promoter funding or the founder funding uh, these days even angel investors put money at the idea stage so that is that is the first stage and from there you know the business starts going you know keep scaling up so you you have a micro micro business after that which is typically funded by family and friends again angel investors and you get to the first institutional round from a institutional investors typically called as venture capital or vcs then the business get into the sme stage where in again venture capitals do funds you also get some very niche private equity guys who funds only sme you also take some bit of mezzanine funding when your business become mid and large you probably try and access capital markets either through ipo route or any other route and again you have private equity companies which which focuses on funding growth capital and you have mezzanine funds funds as well and when the business become mature you know you either do a strategic sale or you have buyout fund control fund or you do large ticket capital market transaction and this is the route by which mature businesses access capital from the market so if you see from the stage of idea to the mature business stage you know the the risk quotient is coming down and so is the return expectation if you ask any investor uh, the return expectation at idea stage and micro business is extremely high the irr expectation is extremely high and as the business matures i think they are adjusting the expectation of return with the lower amount of growth they are taking in uh since we are talking about the types of the funds you know let me also you know uh, give a a, a small uh, insight into how funds are being categorized domestically so quick background you know in india uh, venture capital fund or private equity funds were regulated uh, to an old regulation called venture capital fund regulations 1996 it was in short form was dvcf 1996 those guidelines or rules were were probably updated upgraded in a new form of law called aif regulation 2012 and since then all these funds you know are called alternate investment funds by sebi and they are categorized into three broad categories the genesis of these categories is there are category there are businesses uh, uh, which when funds invest have a very positive impact over the economy uh, and and because of that government of india sebi rbi multiple regulators give lot of incentives these are category 1 investments these are typically early stage investment startups who wants to promote entrepreneurship in this country the so vc funds angel funds sme funds social venture fund some of the infrastructure funds they all come under category 1 then there are uh, category 2 funds which are basically not category 1 and invest in private companies which is which, which are the typical growth equity uh, no uh, private equity funds uh, debt funds uh, these all funds comes under category 2 and then there is a third category which typically is focusing more on public markets or they deploy strategies more like hedge funds try to make short term returns uh, they use very complex strategies also use derivatives at times uh, you know sebi has categorized them into category 3 so i have i have given a, a break up of overall industry uh, type uh, you know vehicle types so there are there are standard globally used terms like angel funds angel investors you know uh, family offices family and friends investing institutional venture capital investments and as a business mature you have private equity funds you have bio funds and regulatory wise in india which are regulated which is domestically regulated by the regulator sebi are categorized as aif category 1 category 2 and category 3 now coming to the industry uh, which was the purpose of this specific section you know uh, this is a slide which highlights the investment trends uh, the the amount of investment and the number of deals done by private equity as an asset class in this country so if you see since 1998 the uh, this is the the earliest uh, data i can get i i couldn't get data before this so 17 deals were uh, were done in that particular year uh, uh, you know and and some 40 50 million dollars were invested to almost 1094 deals done in 2021 where in 60 almost 62 63 billion dollars got deployed so you can see the 
the growth which this asset class has seen and i will i i, I am breaking this growth into three parts from 1998 to 2007 if you see 1998 17 deals were done to 551 de one deals done in 2007 this will be called the private equity 0.1 or you can call it private equity 0 the the infant stage of this asset class is where a lot of money came into this country uh, initial part of 1998 to 2002 was focusing more on dot com to the dot com days were focusing more on technology investments and uh fund became zombie fund they closed their shop they couldn't raise money purely because of lack of performance so from 2007 to almost 2013 2014 if you see the industry remains almost flat the number of deals were you know somewhere between 550 and 600 and there was a there was a you know a steep fall in between in 2009 and 2010 and even if you look at the quantum you know what we saw almost 12 13 billion dollars in 2007 it didn't see that amount back till 2014 and after that came the the new wave which which is the current wave the private equity 2.0 wherein you know uh, the entire vc ecosystem the entire technology businesses the kind of capital they are absorbing attracting and are able to give returns which is where you see a significant growth in this asset class so from 556 deals per year in 2013 14 to almost 1100 deals now in 2021 with almost 63 billion dollars getting deployed so i think the industry has become quite mature uh, able to absorb a lot of capital and you have seen funds who have created significant track record so this industry has has passed its infant stage and in its in its growth stage and i see that over next 10 years this this asset class will grow multifold and which actually opens a huge Uh, amount of job opportunities for uh, you know uh, both the freshers as well as experienced professionals uh, a quick insight on the type of vcp funds the, the amount of money they've been able to deploy over last three years so if you see the early stage businesses the typical vc businesses they have been able to you know uh, uh, the investment uh, trend has been you know, uh, almost 2.1 billion dollars in 2021 Uh, which was almost one and a half billion dollars for the previous two years. The growth funds, the typical private equity funds, have been able to deploy almost 19 billion dollars in 2021. Uh, uh, there has been a good, uh, you know, uh, growth in the pre-IPO area, and there are a lot of dedicated pre-IPO funds. So they also deployed almost one and a half billion dollars last year. Uh, uh, that amount was very very low or almost negligible because there was no IPO market in 2020 and 19. uh buyout funds did almost 17 billion dollars in 2021 the late stage funds which typically invest in stress companies in declining industries they have been able to deploy 19 billion dollars and of course there are you know established five funds which invest in public public companies uh with a private equity mindset they have been able to deploy close to 9 10 billion dollars over last two years per year so this is the the breakup of you know uh, 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 the the capital which is which is being observed through different strategies into the industry this is again a, a repetition of this slide that you know there are the deal break up by sectors the volume etc i will skip this this is a just a quick snapshot about some of the players this is not an exhaustive list you know just to highlight there are there are you know india indian private equity and and venture capital as an asset class has grown enough you have seen most of the popular global names today have a shop here you know from kkr blackstone warburg carlyle apex you know gs capital partners that i work we are also a global fund and then there is a breed of domestic home grown funds you know uh, uh, some of the older names which i can see on this slide is chris capital which was founded in 1997 you have uh, um, you know asset capital has been around since 2008 uh, uh, multiples true north true north has been around for a very very long time i think this is just that they have changed their name Um, you know, um, 2003 or 2004 they have been there. Uh, Lighthouse, Westridge Capital, which is an output which came out of Sequoia, uh, that has been around. Raja has been around for quite a while. While Kotak has been around since 2004. ICICI Ventures, again one of the oldest. I think they have been in the business since 1995. In fact, 
if my memory serves me right, the first venture capital fund in India was set up as a joint venture between UTI and ICICI, and it was called TDICICI in 1987. And I think that JV didn't work out. And then uh, in the late 90s, both ICICI and UTI set up their separate funds, uh, ICICI Ventures and UTI Ventures. So that's a, just a bit of uh, history of how venture capital funds came into this country domestically. So I think these are few, this, this, these slide does not include uh, early stage funds. Uh, there are many of those, you know, Excel Partners, Sequoia, Chirate Ventures, Matrix, Nexus, um, and I am also not included the recent public market funds or the so-called AIS category three funds or many other real estate P funds. So what do you do in private equity? Uh, and I'm going to use private equity and venture capital, you know, um, dif differently in different contexts with, with you know, uh, but the, the purpose is the same, you know, whether you're in private equity, venture capital, at the end of the day, you do the same thing, right? So what, what typically, you know, any investment professional does in this particular profession, right? Irrespective of uh, wherever you are in hierarchy, whether you are at the junior most level or whether the senior most, the process remains the same. So, you know, everybody uh, uh, and the weightage of the responsibility may change specifically what they do. But if you see the overall investment cycle for any investment professional involves that you are engaged in deal sourcing, you source investments for your for your firm, for your firm, you know, these are typically sourced either through your own network, uh, which can be proprietary or through investment banking network or through your entrepreneur founders network, various sources, right? So you, you source investments, you evaluate investment opportunities, which means that you do a thorough diligence and then there is a detailed process of diligence which involves, you know, doing financial modeling to industry research, to doing some primary research, going to the market, doing some secondary research, uh, talking to industry players, Multiple things, right? So that is that is the detailed investment diligence you do. Once you have concluded the investment, once you have negotiated and structured the investment, you try and monitor those portfolio companies because now they are your port, they're part of your portfolio. And as part of monitoring, you try and improvise their governance, help them in business development, you know, and help them improving their analytics, try and send them their areas which during the diligence time you found are, are a bit weak and needs a bit more improvement, et cetera. Uh, parallelly, you do a lot of communication, investor communication with your LPs, etc. Uh, you know, uh, and, and lastly, you try and focus, uh, you know, a uh, 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 um, uh, more on how to generate liquidity for your fund, which is nothing but focusing on creating exit of that particular investment. So these are the broadly five functions which are done by almost every private equity professional wherever they are in the hierarchy. Uh, I have specifically not spoken about the fundraise base and the other related components because I wanted to focus largely on the investment side. Talking about the roles in, in, a, in a VC firm or a PE firm, so let's, let's understand that this profession on, and firms typically hire very, very few people. You know, private equity is called Makkah of investment, you know. Most of the experienced people we want to when you know when they start their career as research analysts, research associates, you know, or working with public market funds, etc. Eventually, want to go and, and and settle in private equity, largely because the kind of exposure you get, uh, the kind of experience you get, is is of, is of very different magnitude and a manner, right? So, uh, so the, but, but this profession has very very limited teams, right? The size of the team is very very small. And again, that is a variable of the amount of asset under management which a firm has and the kind of fees it is charging. So, so you know, uh, 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 when I come to compensation trends later, I will explain, you know, how AUM and fees impact the compensation as well as the size of the team. But just keep in mind that uh, while the ratio in any other financial services firm will be, you know, many jobs and many interested participants ratio is skewed highly towards very, very few jobs and extremely high aspirant who wants to get into this asset class, which means that uh, the skill set, which I'm going to talk about later uh, in, my, in my presentation, you need to be cognizant that irrespective of you may be ace at some of those skill sets, it is not easy to make inroads into this asset class. Uh, the investment role, there is there are there are different types of investment role which I put in, in in future slides and maybe I will go to that slide and come back. 
so this is a typical org structure if you see uh, uh, you know uh, of any private equity firm so the entry level job is is of an analyst and different firms have given different names there there are firms who take pre mba analyst so typically from your graduate school once you have had one or two years of experience you end up uh, uh, you know uh, join a, a, a private equity venture capital firm for a very dedicated period for a one year two year horizon because your goal is just to have that one or two year of experience and then go and do an mba from a global b school or from a reputed category a b school so so these are pre mba analyst jobs and then there are firms who also hire post mba people who want to do who, who, who want to play an analyst role and and what does this typically analyst do they have very very high technical skills good in in research so their job largely involves doing research uh, preparing investment memos doing a bit of um, you know uh, excel modeling and assisting the the, the senior team and in, in, in transaction as you move up in the ladder after spending a year or two year as analyst you uh, you know you join the firm as an associate or you are elevated as an associate as an associate probably you are a, you are a more experienced person and you are expected to do same thing but probably you get involved more with your principals etc into transactions which means that you will you will you will uh, spend a lot more time on monitoring portfolio companies you know day to day job you will also be involved on investor communication side on reporting side writing quarterly reports etc uh again as you elevate after 2 3 years of experience you some of the firm you become senior associate or they also called advice president assistant vice president depending on what kind of work structure they have but a senior associate is more equivalent of a vice president there you you know along with principal you get into negotiations you you probably are actively involved in concluding transactions you're also actively part of sourcing deals for the firm etc so that's where you know your you, The, the role lies but having said that the older job of research you know looking at uh, portfolio companies peer etc that continues as you graduate you know you become principal you are more like a deal deal lead right you lead the deals in the firm you are the principal negotiator you try and do lot of things under a partner uh, uh, sourcing the deals concluding investments etc and probably it's at the principal and the partner level wherein the, the the maximum amount of uh, the the profits which are which which comes to the pool of the carry pool of the firm is being shared uh, and, and in many firms they don't give carry below principal level and there are some firms which which try and share carried interest with senior associate and associate as well but there are very few so uh, and the partner md or the managing partner who is the most senior most partner they typically take the the cake Uh, as far as the the compensation the the carried interest is concerned and they also are the key management people whom lps rely and trust their money so they are involved in fundraising managing lp relationship and are eventually you know uh, responsible for generating roi for the overall portfolio so going back if you see the the investment roles you know uh, uh, is is either uh, for people who are young will be looking and if you are not done mba you will be looking at an analyst role or if you are already an experienced you know you will you will try and get in into a, into this asset class an associate role if you are coming from an outside industry for you to move into private equity at a principal level is or maybe even at a vice president level uh, i won't say it is impossible but it is very very difficult so if at any point in time you want to get into the asset class you probably need to focus on those two bottom most roles Uh, the earlier you get into the asset class, uh, the chances of getting in are higher. Then there are roles beyond investment. Uh, for example, some of the funds, let's say, let's take True North or some of the other funds who do control transactions. These days they have, you know, operating partner roles, so venture partner roles, and even under operate. These are operating teams which basically solely focus on on monitoring the portfolio company. These people come from industry, have industry experience. and since these funds end up own, owning majority or do control transactions they need such industry background people to to manage their portfolio companies to do value add etc so they are they are also now uh, these kind of roles are becoming very popular in the industry earlier it used to be with few buyout funds only now many companies have started hiring 
people uh, who, who can come in operating role, uh, typically call as venture partner or even a team and, uh, you know, under, under the operating framework. And uh, there, there are opportunities in this as well. The next breed, which is becoming very, very popular is ESG roles. You can be an ESG analyst, you can be an ESG uh, you know, uh, associate, you can be an ESG uh, vice president, et cetera, as depending on your experience. So since most of the LPs who give money, especially the DFIs, they have this mandate that you know uh, every portfolio company wherein the funds invest, they need to make sure that the, the additional layer of ESG, which is environment, social, and governor, governance, that question needs to be very, very high, that needs to be tracked, that needs to be measured, and and a lot of uh, a lot of effort needs to go on that front. Uh, and then there are specific principles which are laid out by some of these limited partners. So as a result, you know, firms have started hiring people dedicatedly doing this specific function. And uh, you know, uh, many public market funds which talks about ESG, they actually just do uh, you know exercise on paper what has been reported by the public companies. They will just do analysis do secondary research and reports. It's completely different in private equity. In private equity, an ESG analyst or an ESG associate goes to a particular portfolio company, hires specialist technical teams. You know, when we say that this company has been able to reduce this much amount of greenhouse gases or been able to re reduce this much of carbon footprint, we actually sit and make sure that we measure, get it verified, and then only report, which is not being done by many listed companies, but, but, but a good amount of private companies, especially which are funded by ESG funds are doing a lot. So there are, there are a good amount of ESG roles which are, which are coming, and I think that will be a very interesting area uh, for people to focus on. And I would recommend that people who, have, who, who, who don't have much of experience about ESG, they should uh, think of doing uh, the certificate uh, with CFA Institute has recently launched CFA in ESG investing. I think that is that is a very good program and probably will help you uh, get insights. And the industry has also started accepting that certificate. Another role which is very popular, which is a non-investment role, is an investor relation role. Where you know, funds have dedicated investor relation person. It can be just one or two person team in in larger funds who try and you know manage relationship with limited partners. Some of the other support roles involve accounting uh, roles. You know, you have a dedicated legal counsel who, who looks at the, all the structuring, you know, uh, portfolio agreements, investment agreements, exit agreements. You have a dedicated HR team, the dedicated compliance team, and like that, there are multiple other support functions. This I've already covered. Uh, on the compensation front, you know, as I told you that the size of the team depends uh, on, on the AUM and the fees which typically a, a, a GP is about to can, can charge its fund uh, or the LP. So if you look at the mega fund, the 5 billion plus category, you know, typically an MD and partner will make a fixed salary of anywhere between 350K to a million. And by the way, this is all Indian private equity and venture capital funds data, although I put it in dollars just to make sure that for the global funds who are present in India and the domestic funds, it looks, it's easy to compare, uh, uh, but you know, uh, I just want to say that this is what is currently being paid in India. So an MD or a partner in a, in a, in a large firm with a $5 billion fund will get a, closer to a million dollar in fixed salary. The bonus can range over and above this anywhere between 100 to 300% and they end up making anywhere between 0.5 to 1.5% carry. Uh, a director or a principal level guy makes anywhere between 200K to 500K. If I have to put in Indian currency, 500K is almost like three and a half, four crores per annum. Again, bonus of 100 to 300% and a 0.8% to 0 0.5% to carry. Uh, a, a vice president or a senior associate end up making anywhere between 140K to 250K, uh, a bonus of 80 to 300%, and you know, a, a, a carry of 0 0.05 to 0.08%. Again, as I told you, not many funds gives carry uh, uh, be below principal. So that, that percentage is only for those funds which actually pay carry at that level. And at associate also, you end up making 100K to 120K. This is almost like 75 to 90 lakhs per annum uh, with the 80 to 100% bonus. And carry can be negligible to, to some notional 0 0.0 to 5%. If you are a large fund, which is that your AM is anywhere between $2 billion and $5 billion, I think 
the the trends is in front of you you have a good fixed you know for that 1 million drops to 800k associate level it is almost the same there is a marginal difference for vp and senior associate the carry percentage goes up at all the levels largely because you know the the absolute carry levels are are are, are, are different for a mid size fund which is uh, between 750 million dollar to 2 billion dollar i think uh there is a there's a marginal change in the salary um, at partner level you still get 800k at down the higher side but the bonus is reduced significantly and um, associate and senior associate you know uh, the salary gap is quite high in these um if you go to the small to mid size fund you know you still end up making let's say if you're joining at a vp senior associate you still end up making 50 to 100k associate in india still make 40k to 100k to begin with with a good 60 to 150% bonus and smaller fund which are emptying in empty today everywhere i mean uh, if you look an associate who joins still joins as 40k to 60k so it's a, a 60k uh, you know means that still making a good 45 30 to 45 lakhs to begin with as an entry salary and then with the 30 to 50% uh, bonus and a nominal carry so these are uh, composition trends in indian vc and pe industry the next section is how to how do you get a job in private equity which is essentially basically what kind of skill sets you require and you know uh, uh, i i want to want you guys to focus more on this section because you know wherever wherever i have been talking to some of the career aspirants to look at you know what what exactly they want to learn the only one question which i which i get to hear from them is they always want to know how shall i shall i break into this industry and i will be honest it's not easy because i had mentioned it earlier if there are 10 100 people who want to get into this industry there might not be even a not even a one single job for that i think the ratio will be more like 1 is to 300 so with with this kind of you know a uh, uh, gap between the number of jobs available and the people who are aspiring it is very very important for you that if you want to get into industry what what you should focus on so let's look at what the firms look for and this is i've tried made it make it very very generic instead of getting into you know what do what they look in a vp or in a partner or on a principal or an associate and i've tried and focused more on uh, aspects which typically you will not come across in in other interviews you know these are uh, it is you know, technical skills we all know that are a must they are non negotiable and obviously i'm not going to focus too much on that but there are various other aspects which which firms look at and 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 that's what i'm going to focus in this section so i think the first prerequisite for anybody to get into this industry is humility you have to be humble you have to be down to earth uh i've seen lot of professionals you know uh, uh, especially when they come from investment banking profile they come from uh, you know other consulting jobs etc uh humility as a as a trait is missing and largely because you know I, that they have been very well paid at very early in the career career or probably they have been you know you you while you are very young in your 20s you end up meeting the ceo cxos and up spending a lot of time with them so because you know uh, early success sometimes lead to a situation where people are not able to digest success so private equity firms are very very smart they look humility as one of the most important criteria so you have to be really 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 humble to get into this industry the second most important is selling if you see uh, the roles and and the, the investment life cycle which i discussed every role in private equity involves selling when you are raising fund you are selling to lps when you are you know when you are sourcing deals you are selling to investment bankers when you want to you know do investment you are selling your fund to to uh, uh, an entrepreneur who has got 10 funds in front of him when you want to do the deal you are selling the deal to your investment committee you are selling to your own colleagues and telling them why it's a good investment so like that at every stage you know you you have to sell and that's why selling is very very critical you need to learn how to sell and for that you know some of the important skills are like you need to be extrovert you know your networking skills needs to be sharpened every now and then you need to build a very wide network Uh, don't miss any opportunity when you get to meet people from different walks in life that will really help you to you know to sharpen these skills the third important thing firms look at that do you have relevant experience so there is always a preference for people who are coming from the same industry if not same at least there is some bit of 
alignment there's some bit of familiarity or similarity so you know if you have some research experience some investing experience from some related asset class if not private equity or you know or you have come from specific niche roles where you are which which demonstrate your analytical skills i think you will get get preference the another important criteria is what kind of passion you have for investing so people people do sharpen their investing skills by investing early in their life you know even though you're in your 20s you can do public market investing you can you can invest uh, as a, uh, you can do club investing along with your friends you can you can do investment you can form investment clubs etc so i think the the sheer passion for investing is a very important criteria and trait because that helps you understand the overall investment framework how do you look at risk return etc etc and that's something which forms to evaluate the next one is how curious you know or inquisitive you are you know as you know there are there are certain things your profession teaches you private equity teaches you you know i've been in this profession for so long you know you you always have a questioning mind you always question people why this model will be successful why this particular strategy will work why you think this is the right way or right thing to do etc so i think the if as a as a personality if you if you are not curious by nature if you are if you don't have inquisitiveness i think it will be hard for you to land a job in this asset class the next one is which goes without saying and i'm sure this is common across most of the industries you know your strong work ethics integrity is one of the most important again although the teams are very very small and there is there is a junior team and senior team within this asset class but there's so much of confidential info in the smaller team which is shared so i think people do look at very very strong work ethics uh, you need to have a lot more attention to detail there is no scope for you to to make mistakes you know uh, people do make silly mistakes in, in some of the other jobs and which, which give them an opportunity to rectify it. but private equity profession you can't afford that because you are you have fiduciary responsibility you are managing third parties money and large money you know people who come and give you 50 million dollar 100 million dollar checks you can't can't make mistakes so you know your which means that your attention to detail has to be extremely strong uh, private equity firm do look at whether there is something in you can you be a thought leader you know do you think out of the box so your you get an opportunity to express your ideas your opinions at the weekly forum Uh, within the firm, etc. So, so this is another trait which is extremely important. And these these skill sets eventually will come from you know uh, what you read throughout the day, you know whom you interact with, what kind of people you move around with, etc. Communication skills, writing skills. I think I need not emphasize more on this point. I think um, you meet anybody from private equity industry, you will figure out that how articulative they are. You know their communication skills, their writing skills are of very different level. uh would have seen by now that every role here involves negotiation you are negotiating with the founder you are negotiating with the banker and you know you are negotiating on valuation you are negotiating on rights various other things so negotiation skill is again something which is extremely extremely critical and many people do look for it uh we end up meeting lot of people and you know uh, directly or indirectly we try and you know in, interact with people at all the levels so people management skills is another trait which is extremely important and which uh, you know which is always being evaluated by the firm when they are hiring professionally irrespective of at whatever level they are they are hiring uh, you need to be a team player because you always work as a team uh, on any investment on any project etc and you know the success rate in private equity is is very very low uh, not only for landing the job but even while you are into this industry you know you you try and present some 50 transactions to your firm and probably only one or two goes through which means your ability to handle failures your ability to not able to convince your team your ability to you know being questioned uh, every positive thing which you have told about your firm of your own prospective investment again and again i think these are some things which talks about your temperament talks about your personality talks about how you are you able to handle these you know because sometimes you know we all make mistakes right so if if i'm sitting on the investment committee to a great deal i would i would say no it this doesn't look compelling i don't see this which probably as a pitcher you may you may say no this makes lot of sense but that that ability to handle the failure when in an investment committee has rejected your proposal i think those personality traits are extremely extremely important 
so that's that's something which some few of the skill sets which are extremely critical and i thought i will highlight uh the next section and the last last section which i want to focus on you know just give you few tips tips to all of you on how you can make inroads into vcp industry um, you know um, some of them are very well known but some of them i'm just i've just put my thoughts based on my experience so generally there is a familiarity bias so most of the openings jobs are found either through a personal or a professional network you know if there, there is if you go and do a cold call and say look i am looking for an associate job you may have a great resume but in, in a very high probability that you will not even get a interview call but if you reach out to a to a gp through your professional network personal network etc i think the chances are at least you will you will land an interview for yourself so so try and build on your network if you are looking to get into this industry try and attend industry forum try and connect with people on linkedin you know try and interact with them you should know how to strike a conversation engage them with some of the other projects if they are doing a if they have invested in a specific industry or a specific company and you know they are in particular industry if you have some skill set write a note to them say that look i heard that you guys have done this investment these are few of my initial thoughts i have been involved in so and so etc sometimes you have to showcase your work and unlike past today there are so many social media platform where you can directly or indirectly showcase your work the second one is you know uh, most of the people prepare one page two page resume you know uh, these days youngsters are very very smart they format their resumes with very good format but unfortunately they are not able to customize see every job has, is expecting the firm is expecting to fulfill that particular position and that job which they have created they need to fill certain gaps you may be extraordinary but if you are not fitting in that particular job there is there is a very high likelihood that you may not be able to get that job so which means that depending on which fund what position which firm you are applying for you need to customize your resume some of the examples i have mentioned in the slides is if you are applying to a vc fund most of the vc people are looking for deal sources you know they they like people who are who, who sort a lot of deals which means somewhere you need to highlight you an excellent network you know some of the fantastic successful people in the industry so you know if you can showcase that you know highlight your networking skills i think the probability of you getting job is extremely high if you go to the the, the mature businesses the investors which is the typical growth funds or buyout funds uh, and if you are looking if you are applying for an associate or a senior associate role they want to see your work especially they want to see your technical skills etc which means your focus needs to be needs to be that yeah. so so it's very very important that every job which you are looking at you probably customize your resume the next important thing which nobody will tell you is that from the time you apply job the fund and the firm are actually watching each and every action of yours the mails which you write to them the manner in which you approach them how you dress yourself how you carry yourself when you come for interview your your choices of colors your choices of words while speaking you know please don't make mistakes i have seen you know very very smart people from some of the reputed b schools comes and they make very very basic grammatical errors and i think some of these things piss off the recruiters or or the fund firm so 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 you know since there are very limited jobs you need to make sure that there is no scope for any kind of mistake and that is something which is very very important for all of you to focus on a uh, domain expertise always help if you have if you are coming from an industry you have some industry experience and if that industry is an area of focus for the firm where you applied for a job that definitely help you to get into that industry you also need to develop additional skills you just can't say that i'm very good at financial modeling which everybody is today you know um, you need to you need to know where the world is moving the new trends you know so when you are getting and talking to a vc if you can show that your understanding about crypto about blockchain is extremely high or if you are getting into a a climate fund and you can really tell about your give insights on the overall esg framework what is happening around the globe etc i think you will be able to differentiate yourself so which means that you know sharpen your skills in specific domain try and take some additional certifications etc and if you are from a specific industry where the fund is investing that will definitely be advantages in your favor uh, always keep some questions ready to ask to the interviewer you know most of the time when your interview is over the interviewer says any questions for us 
and you know i've seen most of the candidates they will just smile and say no no everything is fine i don't have anything i think again i told you every act of yours is being watched very very closely and you need to make sure that uh, whatever you act upon react upon you know will have an impact so if you say i don't have any questions which means that the the interviewer depending on his personality may judge you one way or the other the most obvious way they say that okay this guy's curiosity question is very very low is not as intuitive or probably you know he is too desperate to get into he is not even questioning the basic thing etc the last one is you know the second last one is always follow up post interview you know many people uh, don't follow up the uh, post interview they always wait 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 i think that is one extreme and then there i've seen extreme where people by the time even before the interview reaches his desk they will send a thank you email and then 12 hours later so is any update etc etc so don't you have to balance it out you have to follow up in a very very diplomatic way at the same time you don't have to show desperation uh you need to mentally be prepared that entry level jobs in this industry require very very long work hours you know some of my uh, junior colleagues you know they work 18 hours a day because the amount of work which is there on the table is insane and you need to learn to live with it because we all have gone through that rigor to that cycle uh, so when you are interviewing getting interviewed uh, by any fund when you are when you are when you are doing this please demonstrate your ability that you can work long hour, long hours you are a work hard you have done this in past etc uh i i mentioned earlier also your passion for investing is very very critical to so sharpen your investing skills if you are not investing in public markets please do that that will help you uh, you know get better insights into many multiple industries you will understand do your own independent research uh most important i always tell people read 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 across all the journals you know, it's very very important for you to be a, a, a well read person read about current events politics read about philosophy read about industry experts etc i mean and, and these days it's just not about reading you can listen to various podcasts etc so do that your writing skills are very very critical try and improvise on that try and write blogs etc it is very very critical these things will definitely help you and sometimes it is very difficult for you to find a direct correlation that okay my this skill set is very important why i am not getting a job you never know these all skill sets which i'm talking about where it will help you when you are when you are being interviewed and uh, one of the most important which many people ignore that okay no i'm not from a top b school or i don't have x degree i just have one degree people have dual degree etc i think for entry level jobs because there are very few few things and very many people applying people who have got multiple qualifications on people who are from people who are you know from the the, the top cream layer they will always get preference so which means education qualification does matter you if you have a cfa charter holder if you are mba from a prestigious school if you are a chartered accountant i think these all are, are are really going to work in your favor so these were the few slides which i wanted to present uh, thanks a lot for your time and happy to answer if you guys have any question thanks abhishek uh, i think the talk was quite comprehensive and uh, i'm sure it has have benefited many of the young candidates charter holders a lot of questions uh, uh, which keep uh, came in i think uh, uh, one very interesting one was that what's the work life balance in the industry i think you briefly touched about it but maybe you can you can you know talk about through the career progression how it moves so i think uh, people who think about work life balance uh and again these are different school of thought but let me tell you the most successful professional is a person who doesn't feel like that he is at work while he is at work and when you have that kind of mindset i don't think that there is a concept called work life balance i mean i will give you a example of my own you know uh it's been what two two and a half years we all have been working from home and you know i i i never felt a need to go to office and i never felt the need to be at home because wherever i am whether it's a sunday and monday my work is always on and then there are weekdays where i'm at home spending time with family so i'm automatically able to balance you know there are in this profession there are days months and weeks wherein you will be working 24 bar 7 and then there will be periods wherein you know you get to spend a lot of time with your family do a lot of multiple activities and because this profession involves uh you know uh, you need to have skill set 
we have various dimensions of skill sets you need to develop so even while you are at on on a vacation on holiday on travel your mindset of doing due diligence your mindset of tracking things your mindset of you know learning new things etc will always those antennas will always be on so if you think of work life balance like no no i want to be in office till 6 o'clock and then i want to spend some time with family i don't think so this industry is for you but if you if you learn if you love your profession i don't think so you will ever get to that concept called work life balance because in a way it is already balanced the kind of diversity it offers in terms of different deal situations different industries yeah. so your mind is always occupied but you will never get bored with it yeah and then and, and because you enjoy this profession you know so when i say yeah. that your passion for investing is important you know you enjoy so much that you yourself will always want to solve that so it's only on those technical jobs wherein you are fed up of sitting in front of screen wherein you need a break and you say oh this too much of work i've written too long a code today etc that's not the case here It's a thinking job, twenty four seven, and uh, it's a way of life. Absolutely, it's a way of life. So another interesting question somebody has asked, uh, which is, uh, you did mention a lot about uh, the soft skills uh, in terms of uh, your networking or in terms of being able to sell. So one person has asked that, look, what is the future for introverts in this industry? Assuming they're extremely good at what they do. If you are lucky. you will get a job in this industry but you will not be able to grow uh i'm sorry to say this but unfortunately the skill that required for you to grow in this profession uh requires you to interact with people from different backgrounds people from different levels of hierarchy people from different walks of life on a daily basis and and, and you will have to deal uh multiple such people with which has got very varied and different personality and manage them and their expectation and if you are an introvert you will not be able to do it you will you yourself will resign and say look this is not meant for me so and and know where it is written that an introvert cannot convert himself or herself into an extrovert it is just the mindset which you need to change and probably you need to develop few skills and and work on them so i i again repeat that more than because see technical skills are something which probably even if you guys don't know you will be able to learn that in next 6 months 12 months excel modeling understanding financial concepts these days there are different and more avenues to learn all these things it is the softer skills which will differentiate you right and if you really want to differentiate yourself so you need to learn on how to sell you need to learn how to network with people and this all eventually tend to amount to only one single trait of the personality which is extrovert so you need to become extrovert i think that is a must i think one more thing which you kind of briefly touched upon but many of the uh, people have uh, wanted to know uh, was that is cfa enough do you need to do an mba if i am at a level 1 can i find a job level 2 can i find a job level 3 can i find a job is you do you need a cfa plus ca i think you you have kind of sort of addressed it but since the question has been asked so many times maybe you want to take a i uh, uh, not uh, 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 take it up again okay so whoever has asked this question let me turn tables to her or him and ask hey, look i am a cfa level 2 guy priyank is a chartered accountant plus mba from harvard business school and then there are another 30 40 people who are chartered accountants and you know to be cfa level 1 etc and there is just one job to offer whom will you offer that i'm i'm pretty sure the obvious answer will be priyank because he is somebody who deserves it he has he has worked hard for it he has all the requisite skill set and he fills all those gaps which that particular job is asking for you know that firm is asking for that i need to fill in these skill sets these complementary skill sets are required in my team and probably priyank is filling that so many times we as job aspirants always think what skill sets we have what designation we have what qualification we have but we never see that whether that we are marrying with the with the job which what it is asking for and when there is a apple to apple comparison and if you front four or five apples in front of you you will pick and choose the most red and most good looking apple to make sure that it 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 becomes like a gem in your fruit basket right so can you find a job if you are just a cfa level 1 yes you can but it but you know there is a, there is a there is a 
factor called luck which matters at times there are people with level 1 and level 2 have found a job uh, in some of the funds but you know that is that is sheer luck in normal circumstances i think you need to have you know a cfa is a global designation is a gold standard in investment is definitely something which firms give a lot of weight to mba from prestigious schools definitely a lot of weight is given to chartered accountant is definitely one of the sort after designation so these are three four very popular designations qualifications which are looked after if you have two of them three of them it's an added advantage but if you are not even completed one and you are just a bcom and cfa level one i'm sorry i don't think so somebody will entertain you because i've told you in, at the beginning also there are very very limited number of jobs and there are thousands and thousands of people you know uh, you guys will not believe every day i get two or three applications who want to get into this industry my linkedin box is full i half of them people i'm not even able to reply it's unfortunate but you know people need to think if they are getting into industry it's just not that they want to get into does it do they have in themselves that they can get into this industry and that's why i wanted to tell you all about these skill sets that if you don't have and if you are really really keen develop these skill sets technical skill sets you all will be on par some of them there may not be much of difference another question which i think has come a couple of times is that we talked about the soft skills but which are the technical skills one should definitely possess uh, uh, to find a job or an interview in this industry and that depends on on honestly it depends on what level you are interviewing from and i don't know in the audience if there are experienced people who are in some investment banking background or equity research background but let me address assuming that majority of will be young professionals if you are looking for an analyst or an associate job i think uh, your excel modeling skills you know whether you are able to develop uh, a good financial model you know whether on the m and a side on the you know evaluating opportunity from the fund side or a leverage buyout buyout opportunity from how do you leverage etc those those excel skills are extremely extremely critical that takes care of your of your majority of your your part of your technical skills and after that how do you write reports how do you prepare an investment memo so your writing skills very very i mean per se writing comes in soft but it is also a more of technical in our profession than than you know being being soft skills so i think these are the two most critical uh, skills in case you want me to quantify them in terms of priority these are the two most important there may be few more but these two are very very critical yeah i think uh, uh, basically industry evaluation and a company evaluation yeah depending on entire spectrum of vc to pe i think these are two things which a young guy starts with and continues doing it for a couple of years absolutely and we at at whatever level even when you become partner you will still evaluate industry and companies right so the skill set will be there with you and becoming better and better yeah so so whatever goes into doing this a uh, 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 kind of a technical skill i think most recruiters look for while hiring for this uh, jobs okay another uh, 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 very interesting question uh, somebody has asked that uh, what was the reason why in 2021 we saw so many deals and so many large deals at that is it a covid effect or is it the backlog of 2019 20 i think uh, uh, you know uh, we are an asset class which is largely driven by the dry powder which we create from our lps and these lps are are typically the large institutions sitting in us europe you know and uh, other developed uh, world countries right so if you see the way money was being printed that money found its way in all the asset classes and private equity and venture capital was also not spared so the way public market got money i think many funds got a lot of money and that led to a bit of you know uh, while there was a demand from the early stage ecosystem startup world as well as some of the mid sized companies to raise money there was also enough and more dry powder available probably which led to some of these investments and more importantly if you see this trend has not happened is not change in 2021 2021 happened to be one of that year but if you look at the trend again uh, you know we have we have been growing constantly year on year both in terms of number of deals and the amount being invested especially on the technology side for for almost last 4 5 years so i think and this is this this particular thing is going to grow as, as at least for next few more years the only thing is that you know sometimes this this data 
there, there, are, there are a bit of anomalies, you know, there is visibly one large deal like a flip card, which happened in 2016, $18 billion transaction. So, so sometimes that helps in, you know, making data look odd as far as the trend is concerned. But in general, I think the trend is upwards. And I did mention that next 10 years, I see Indian private equity venture capital industry grow multifold, both in terms of number of deals, as well as the, the amount invested uh, in this country. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, the industry was already in a virtuous cycle and uh, liquidity brought in the expectation of dry powder, sort of. Uh, yeah. okay. Another interesting question is somebody wants to know, uh, and that's a whole bunch of questions actually are put together. So uh, what's the difference in PE versus a family office, PE versus a mezzanine fund, PE versus private debt? Okay, I think so these are, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, but I think these are very academic, but I will just take a minute to address all of them. So, you know, uh, typically when an individual make a lot of wealth, uh, you know, they try and institutionalize the wealth, it's their own wealth to their own office, and they call them that as a family office. So for example, Azim Premji, who made a lot of wealth through Vipro, has made Premji Invest as a family office, and Naran Murthy, who made a lot of wealth in Infosys, you know, uh, institutionalized its entire investment program through its own family office called Catamaran Ventures. So I think family office is nothing but managing an individual's wealth, just making making more a professional setup and trying to give an institutional framework. That's what family office is. Private equity is the typical institutional fund to raise money from third parties, largely you know, in, uh, investors across the globe, and you know invest. A mezzanine fund are people who provide the uh, uh, you know, uh, structured diet typically, or, you know, uh, they are they are basically a, a, a bridge between two specific grounds, you know, this mezzanine funding, which comes in a, you know, a, a, with a dedicated expected IRR, etc. more like a structured debt kind of format. Private debt are typical, the new age debt investors, you know, like your trifecta or your black soil, etc., which legally are more like NBFCs, but they end up investing more in, you know, young, companies which find difficult to get money from banks etc and give money to them they are called private debt funds yeah. okay now uh, i think the last one uh, we have uh, let's check i think we covered most of them yeah the last one what are the suggestions regarding the books that you're reading the blogs one should read or websites one should follow <laughs> i think uh, this this just these three questions i can do another one hour session someday you know because there's so much to read there's so much to absorb and probably it's very very difficult but i think uh, considering the nature of today's session probably i will recommend uh, a few books uh, to to all of you uh, you know um, you should if you want to develop your skill sets on a venture capital side you need to uh, focus on reading some very, very interesting books, which has been written, uh, which will give an insight on how venture capitalists think, how venture capital as a profession work. One of my favorite is uh, Zero to One. It is written by uh, uh, Peter Thiel. I think uh, one of the best book, uh, it will talk about the venture capital philosophy. You know, very, 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 uh, very, very good book. Uh, the Another one which probably will help you to think on how to structure transactions, etc. There's a book called Venture Deals, uh, you know, it's by Brad Sled and Jason Mandelson. That is again a very, very good book. It will really, really give you a very different perspective. Uh, uh, another one which probably is more on the business culture because in in in, in venture capital and private equity investments, you you spend a lot of time in in developing and building the culture of the of the investing companies, try and evaluate them, help them, etc. So there is a book called what you do is who you are, how to create your business culture by Ben Horowitz. I think that is another very, very interesting book, which you should definitely read. This is, this is on more from a VC or a P perspective. Uh, I'm not recommending any books which will teach you academics of P and VC, because that is something which I'm sure you can pick up off the shelf, any of the book, or everybody will talk about the same academic stuff. As far as podcast is concerned, I like, uh, uh, you know, um, A16Z, uh, I think they they have some some fantastic uh, you know, some of the fantastic podcasts I've heard is on their station. I think that you should definitely think. 
again it depends what is your area of interest you know there is a there is a b line of podcast on crypto if you're interested in crypto and blockchain there is something on consumer tech you know if you want to follow that so i think what is your area of interest what exactly you want to do you will find different things and you know, some of the links you may find if you go through some of my old post on linkedin or twitter you will find some of the recommendations but let me see if over this weekend i can again post on twitter and then you guys can have a look at all the podcast etc yeah that's that's going to be useful i'm sure for people and thank you so much uh, i think we're running out of time now so thank you so much for sharing your insights uh, as a reminder to our listeners please do complete the evaluation survey that must have appeared on your screen by now cfa institute and society members can claim professional learning credits by logging in their online pl tracking tool and uh, there are a bunch of and very interesting upcoming webinars you can see them on the screen so do register if not done already is career insights into wholesale banking on 10th february portfolio insights uh, webinar which is building an angel portfolio which is scheduled for 24th february uh, ceo insights which is uh, global earning calls at big data at scale uh, which is on 24th march and uh, i think the 12th edition of much awaited india investment conference is happening on 21st and 22nd january and apec alpha summit on 10th and 11th february thank you uh, everyone thanks abhishek uh, thanks to thanks priyank yeah. thank you everyone